Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Cars and Coffee with me, Kenny Brown, where over the next half hour, hour, whatever it is, we'll talk about some cool tech things. First, I got a question. How many people know what the angle should be on a lower control arm on a live axle car inside to outside? We'll talk about that in a little bit. What about brake pad compounds? You know which brake, Brad, Brad, brake pad compound is best for your application? I've got uh, I've got a little uh, uh, memorabilia to throw in. That seemed to be pretty popular with people, so I thought I'd, uh, every week I maybe I throw a little bit more memorabilia in, so we kind of like a little uh, flash in the past. So uh, so here I am, Kenny Brown, and this is Cars and Coffee. And uh, it's interesting. Today's episode is driven solely by your questions, the uh, questions that have come in through the either Facebook or Speed Therapy uh, Society or through the, you know, what we get in here and as far as calls to the sales department. Uh, Speed Therapy Society, I mentioned that. If you're not aware of it, it's a great, it's a great uh, private Facebook book, private Facebook group group. Boy, my tongue just isn't working this morning. It must be the weather. It's kind of cloudy and dank over here. Uh, but anyway, the, the Speed Therapy Society is a great group of people, with lots of information shared. And uh, I strongly recommend that uh, if you're a car guy, and want to want to deal with other car guys of like minds sign up for it uh, let's see we also uh, <clears throat> we had uh, uh, it's kind of a hiccup this week so speak therapy academy this post but we're going to start tuesday which means we're still going to be taking uh applications and and getting people signed up up through week two of the academy because you can always go back and watch the uh watch the the, the recorded session so because we've got, you know, Carrie's, Carrie's kind of been out and we've moved and uh, there's a lot going on around here. We, we just, we had to push this, the academy back. So we're pushing the enrollment back for another couple of weeks. So if you think you might be interested, uh, please get a hold of us. We'll get you some information. And uh, if it's a budgetary thing, we've got financing. So it's uh, so always something to think about. If you really want to learn this stuff, if, if you think I teach you a lot on Saturday mornings, the, the academy would just blow you away. So I think let's uh, let's, let's start with some memorabilia. And uh, I, I dug out some uh, some magazine articles from I don't know what year this is. Oh, this is from '95. This goes back a ways. It's in '95. Uh, this one must be around the same. But this is on the uh, on the Callahan quarter horses that we built. Uh, we did, there, was a, there was a Ford dealership here in Indianapolis uh, called Callahan Ford, and he was kind of like a performance guy and loved Mustangs. So we did a series of Callahan, he called them quarter horses, so Callahan quarter horses. And we, I can't remember how many, so a few, a few weeks back, somebody asked how many Callahan Okay, everybody. It looks like uh, we've had some issues with our internet service uh, at the shop. So Kenny will be logging back in, it looks like. Uh, so there sorry that happened. Got it? Okay, I'm back. Okay, you're a little blurry, but we'll see. There we go. I'm back on a, a different uh, do you camera move, thing. Do you want to move yourself to a different camera screen because you're going to be showing parts? Can you go in there? And, there you go. Okay. And your head's cut off. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. We we tested this last night on Zoom, and everything worked perfect. This morning, we've had all kinds of hiccups with StreamYard. Uh, so we don't know if it's our internet or StreamYard, or it's just like the sunspots or, or, or sun flares. So anyway, uh, this, this, this article was written by uh, Evan Griffey. And it was in high tech performance in '95, and this one was written by Evan Smith, and this was in Muscle Mustangs and Fast Forward. So it was they were pretty popular when we did them. Uh, I can't remember can how many. Up, we, can what? you hold up the other one a little bit too, so we can see it a little longer? Both that of one? them. Yeah, and the other one too. There you go. About that. That's good. Hold up the, so you can see the cars. That's a pretty interesting car. They're good. Yeah, they were, they were actually a lot of fun. They were, they, were our, they were our basic GT4 
type package uh, back in, I think, 95, 96, maybe 97, I can't remember. But that's uh, that, that's going back a ways. I, I've had I've had Mustangs and magazines for a very very long time. But yeah, it was kind of a fun project. Uh, and uh, every now and again, we got somebody call us up and says, "Hey, I've got a quarter horse. What can you tell me about it?" So it has a little memorabilia. Uh, we'll see what else we can come up with in the weeks coming. So I think we're going to do. I'm going down my list. If, okay, I, I'm remembering this without any help, if you're just joining us, uh, I'm Kenny Brown, this is Cars and Coffee, and uh, over the next hour, well, less than an hour now, uh, we're going to be talking a little tech and answering your questions, which reminds me, you can send in questions live, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, if I can't answer them, I will. If I can't answer them, I, I just, I mean, there's no BS here. Either I know the answer or I don't. So please, please send your questions in and uh, I'll get to them uh, towards the end. So you know, moving through here, remember I said that uh, uh, about the control arm angle? Well, this is, this is a question from Rob. He says, on a four-link car, what is the angle of the suspension bars inboard to outboard compared to square? Uh, not an up and down angle. Uh, also, do you plan on making it to any of the days to PRI? Uh, don't have an answer on PRI yet uh, because it's just, it's, <laughs> at this stage, it's too far off and we got too many things going on. However, uh, on a four link, uh, I don't, on my suspensions, there is no angle. Uh, can we, uh, there, that's better. On my, sus my suspensions, uh, all, the, all the control arms are parallel. Now, the as, as far as you know, how the, all those those uh, angled suspension uh, angled control arms work, we talk a lot about that in the academy in the suspension of geometry section, and you know what's what's good and what's bad about them. Uh, but the reason that manufacturers angle the control arms is so that the axle becomes self-centering. If the axle is self-centering, they don't have to put like a panel bar in, and that's uh, more cost-effective. And the older Mustangs. I think they were out like maybe three to five degrees on the on the on the bottom and about 40, 45 degrees the other way on the top. Uh, the new 197s, they're out about maybe four or five degrees on the bottom. However, uh, if you do if you're doing geometry uh, and we're taking, let's say we're taking a look at the suspension from up high looking down, plan view. Uh, if you were to take the, the angle of those control arms and draw a line to where they intersect. And in the one in the one ninety sevens intersect you know well behind the car, and take that line and draw it through the roll center, which in the stock Mustang is pretty high. Then all of a sudden that gives you kind of a roll axis, and uh, the roll axis of the stock Mustang is kind of like up in the air. Uh, rear sus rear suspension roll axis it kind of points up in the air. So what I do is on our our uh, AGS four point rear grip kit, uh, we actually I have offset bushings, uh, front and rear, so that we move the the uh, the front in and the back out. So we end up with a parallel parallel to center line control arm. And when we're parallel to center line, what that does is that all of a sudden you don't have any line of conversion. So we have no so without a line of conversion, that means the intersection point is infinity. At that point what happens is all of a sudden then you take the rear roll uh, roll center, and then the roll axis is parallel to the lower control arm, and which we mostly try to have down just a little bit in the front to create rear uh, roll understeer. Uh, but see, the having the control arms straightened out is only one part of our AGS 5.0 4.0 suspension system, uh, and specifically the rear grip kit, because there's a lot of elements that make the whole rear grip kit work. Now, kind of, uh, for those that maybe haven't uh, heard a lot about the rear grip kit, I'm going to go through it again, just kind of briefly, just so that you know, it's a system. But yeah, we, we sell control arms uh, and everything else, but more, we'd rather sell the entire system because every single component is engineered specifically to work with every other single component. So like this, by having the, uh, the uh, control arm, also notice these are really light, aluminum radius rods, and I, I dropped down to, uh, you know, most people use a great big clunky three-quarter rod end. 
Uh, I dropped down to the uh, five eights, but we use a super high grade, super high grade professional level uh, five eights rod and it's Teflon lined. So there's no noise and, and long and it, it lasts a long time. So, but the, the, the whole idea, this, this works with, by going parallel, that works with the roll center. Okay, speaking of the roll center, what we do, where the, where the planter bar crosses the center line of the car, that's your rear roll center. That's the point that the back of the car wants to roll around, like going through a corner. And if you've got a stock suspension, I'm sure that you felt going around the corner, like the inside tire gets a little loose or, or gets light. And if you get to the gas too soon, the back of the car gets kind of whippy. So by moving the, uh, the, the panner bar down, you see how much we move the panner bar down. From there down to there. By moving the panner bar down, uh, we lower the roll center at the bottom of the differential, which is pretty much as theoretically as low as you can get a roll center on a live axle car. I said theoretically. I'm back, you know, the, uh, everybody says, well, what's the link panel bar? What's the difference? Uh, what's link actually is better the, at, at, at centering the axle. It's the best way to center the axle. However, wherever that center pin is, that's your roll center. And you can never get that roll center down very low, uh, like we do with, with the panel bar at the bottom of the differential. In the Trans M days, we used to take and mount a Watts Lake horizontal to the bottom of the differential. So we'd get the benefits of a watch, but we also have the, the, the roll center on the bottom of the diff. Well, that's what we do with, with the roll center relocation kit, because we move it all the way down to the bottom of the differential. And again, we have a really nice. Super heavy duty uh, aluminum radius rod. Uh, it looks, it actually look really cool underneath the car. So that's kind of how the roll center is working with the lower control arms. Okay, so what else works together? Well, the ax axle brackets, our axle brackets, and the upper control arm module uh, is how that is, is kind of they work together too. Now, this, these are our axle brackets, and i um, sure you've seen a lot of other people's axle brackets out there that have a lot of holes, and the great big you know, part of the thing comes up in the back, and it's, you know, they, they seem clunky. This is, this is pretty straightforward, and you can notice there's only one hole. Uh, the reason for that is I've already done the engineering, and I've picked the location for the lower control arm, that creates the instant center I'm looking for. Now, what is the instant center? The instant center is if you look at the car sideways, and again, if you draw a line, lower control arm, upper control arm, the point of conversion is called the instant center. And wherever the instant center is dictates how much anti squat there is in the car or how fast you get weight on the tires for traction. And the other part of that is the upper control arm module works together with the axle brackets. Now this is different, you probably did a lot different than anything else you've seen out there for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, the control arm's longer than the stock. Secondly, the pickup point has been moved. Like I say, I, I put the pickup points for the lower control arm and the upper control arm, so I get the instant center I'm looking for, so I'm getting the anti-squat I'm looking for. And the thing about this is you notice the, our uh, up, uh, upper control arm is curved. <laughs> Well, there's a really good reason for that. When we run cars, you know, fairly low on track or even on the street, if you hit a big bump and you've got a straight uh, upper control arm, it, it's going to crash into the, into the tunnel. So I don't know why more people don't curve their upper control arms, but uh, we do, and it works very well. So that's kind of like an entire system that works together. So if you've got the upper control arm module, the axle brackets, are creating the instant center, which is anti-squat. And anti-squat is also anti-lift, under braking, so the back of the car doesn't want to hop up. And then the, the panner bar moves all the way down to the bottom of the front, so the the roll center. And <clears throat> the lower control arms are parallel, so we, we bring the roll axis down parallel to the, uh, to the lower control arms. The other thing about bringing the rear roll center down, if you've gone around a quarter fast in a Mustang, it feels like, first thing you feel, as you turn in and it kind of let you start to get some understeer or a push. Uh, and that's because 
what's happening is the front roll center and the lower Mustang is really low. It's, it's like at ground or below ground, and the rear is really high, so it's kind of like this. So as you go into a corner and the car starts to roll, it's rolling all that weight up on the outside front tire, which is why you get you can turn in, but then you get like understeer through the corner, and then you have to wait for the axle to settle because, again, the roll center is high to get back to the gas. That's a typical Mustang going around a corner. But what we what I do with with the AGS 4.0 the, the rear suspension obviously we bring the rear roll center down, the front grip kit we bring the front roll center up so it's a lot flatter. Which means going around the corner you're not rolling up on that outside tire, which means we're taking a lot of the uh, the uh, understeer away. Uh, plus we've got other geometry in in the uh, front grip kit that helps the car. I mean the cars just turn. You know, it's not like pe people are amazed how they're used to fighting with understeer through a corner and with a rear grip kit, front grip kit, the cars just turn. In fact, my suspension only has three components, the rear grip kit, the front grip kit, the springs and shocks. So, and like I say, all the engineering is done. All you have to do is bolt it on, follow instructions, and the cars will handle like crazy. Uh, so also by front roll center up, rear roll center down, the, the car doesn't push as much through the corner and you don't have to wait as long. Uh, for the for the axle to settle so you get back to the gas a lot sooner which means you're making the next straightaway longer and because we've done got anti dive in the front and i and i lift in the back you, you can break a lot later than anybody else which makes that straightaway longer so we make the straightaways longer and the corner shorter because the car will rotate really well with the front geometry and then the way we do the roll centers so you know that gets back to the original question i don't i don't do uh displayed control on everything i do is parallel but if you do a parallel control on you have to use something to, to locate the axle, lateral location of the axle. In this case, it's the panner bar. But, but like I say, you know, factory cars that, that have double splayed uh, control arms, that's simply because they use that to center the axle. Uh, so it makes it simple and, and inexpensive for the manufacturers. Uh, if you have any more questions than that, you certainly please uh, go online and set up, uh, set up a 15 minute console with me and I can talk it through more with you if you have something more specific that you'd like to know. Okay, now we have uh, Andy. How much at all will winter tires help on 2019 Mustang GT in the Midwest? Well, in the Midwest, we kind of have crappy winters. Uh, and the tires that come on like on the gts or even the performance pack are well it depends on which tires you get on your car if you've got all season tires then you're okay if you've got like the performance pack we've got summer tires and summer tires in cool weather just it's not a good combination uh they don't grip they, you know that they there's no grip especially when it gets cold but you know if you're going to drive your mustang in the winter uh, I would suggest some really good high performance all season tires. And you know, I just, just did a really quick, I just uh, pulled up the tire rack and did a really quick search. And uh, see, a, it's, the Continental has uh, something called the Extreme Contact DWS 06 Plus. And the, the, uh, the ratings on it, customer ratings, are really high for all types of performance, including. Uh, snow and rain so i mean if you if you and they weren't that that expensive so i mean if you need to drive your mustang in the winter time uh and you're up up here in the midwest where it gets kind of cold and chilly ab absolutely it'd be a gr best idea to get yourself some good high performance all season tires uh, because they'll work in the winter time and the summer tires that come with the mustangs i can tell you are not going to work as soon as you get below about uh, 50 degrees all of a sudden the grip's going to go away uh, you know, they're not going to grip, they're going to spin. So yeah, winter tire, all season tires for the, for, for the winter, summer tires for the summer. Track tires for the track. Okay, so here's, here's another one. Oh, Brian wanted to know, did I ever experiment with an SLA front suspension on a 79 to 04 chassis? Good question. Well, why don't I do this? The answer is yes. We did uh, a number of years ago. Uh, 
I did a narrow track version of my 197 uh, double wishbone suspension uh, for uh, a good friend of mine who was racing uh, American Iron in NASA. Uh, he, I can't remember what year car it was, I think it was a New Edge. But uh, I put together, we, we tried to adapt the S197 double wishbone and it just would not, would not go. So what I did is I was at a shop, a friend of mine who used to work for uh, uh, Riley and Scott as a fabricator. And what I ended up doing is I ended up drawing out the pickup points on the floor with a Sharpie. And then, uh, and then with all the dimensions of height and everything, and uh, uh, he just you know kind of built the suspension in midair. And actually it turned out to work pretty good. It's, uh, is it coming back? Yeah, but it's a, it's a good year away, at least a year away, maybe more. Uh, it's, uh, we've got a set of prototype parts, but we've got so much going on right now. Uh, it's, it's, I got a huge, uh, new product development pipeline. Uh, it's in there, uh, but it's, 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 it's a ways away. So that's the answer to your question. And question is yes. So, okay. And the next question, uh, this is from Bill. Are you going to release small batches of M Okay, it looks like we're having a few more technical difficulties. I'm sure Kenny's going to be logging right back on. Um, there he is. He's coming back on right now. Is he it? I don't know why it does that. I see your, your picture. There we go. There we go. And you've got a whole different. Uh... <laughs> Always technical difficulties. This time it is the internet. So again, uh, Brad, if you want to add the uh, link for the 15-minute uh, uh, consult for Kenny so people can join in. If you have any questions for Kenny on, on anything or any car-related questions, uh, he offers a free service, uh, a free 15-minute uh, consult. You can talk to him about any tech questions you have. If you want him to help you create a build plan going forward, if you have any questions on track days, performance street or actually racing he's uh, available to talk to you so uh, click the link and sign up on his calendar and he'll you'll have an appointment with him okay getting back to i don't know what's going on with this morning it must be sun flares or something because it's everything has been acting up since we even before we're getting everything ready anyway getting back to mn12 or the uh, the t-birds uh back in the in the 90s and we did do, because um, that my uh, apprentice engineer that worked with me back then, Chuck, uh, was a T-Bird guy. We did have a, a small group of, of T-Bird parts that we manufactured and sold. But uh, when we brought the company back, it, it's like the there, there's not enough uh, demand or volume to even think about <clears throat> going back <clears throat> to like the MN12 cars. Uh, I mean, we've got, we've got more things that we can do right now. Uh, and we, so the answer is, unfortunately, uh, we don't have any plans to, to do it again. It says that he'd love to have another shock tire bar 96 to match the one that was 95. Uh, what you might do is, is see if there's any like fabricators around the area uh, that can take the one you've got and copy it and make you another one. Uh, that would be my best suggestion. Okay, let's see. Huh. And Bill wants to know on your front grip kit, for the 94 and 95 Mustangs, the five liter push rod engine, what parts uh, or modifications do I need to install this on a 88 to 93 Fox body? Okay, well, to answer that question, Bill, let's do this. This is the in installation instructions for that K-member, and if we scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, right here, you can see the modification that need to be made for a Fox body uh, to put our SN95 K-member on. Let me blow it up just a little bit more. Uh, it's, uh, I will say on most Fox bodies. Uh, the production tolerances on Fox bodies is not very good. And, uh, but uh, so I would say on, on most Fox bodies, this is about all you really need to do uh, to uh, get the uh, the K member to, to fit. 
So you'd have our front grip kit, SN95 front grip kit for the, it'd be there 94, 95, the five liter one for the Fox body. So uh, yeah, it looks pretty cool in there, doesn't it? Okay, so that was built. And uh, okay, Kathy needs upgraded brake pads on a 550 Mustang with performance pads. Uh, and we offered G Lock. Uh, uh, what do you like so much about these? And what types of compounds do you offer? I use the car for light street and track, brake rotor temperatures, uh, never get above 800 degrees. Uh, brake rotor temperatures, uh, people, if you haven't been with me for a while, we actually, I, I, I pick brake compounds based off of what the maximum rotor temperature is. And we actually have, I should have brought some out. We actually have rotor temperature paint that you paint on your rotor and it'll change colors as the temperature increases. And, and the, the, uh, the big answer is we've got a whole ton of compounds. Uh, we've got, and the reason we've switched over to the G-Lock for our track day guys is a couple things. Uh, they're they're uh, more cost effective than some of the other brands. Uh, also, they seem to be pretty darn good on rotors. Uh, they treat rotors pretty well. And the third thing is on the, on the track pads, we can get them pre-bedded. So you don't have to wait and waste an entire session uh, bedding your brake pads, you know, Saturday morning. And you can get straight to getting your tire temperatures and your pressure set. But to give you an idea, we've got a really nice uh, performance street pad that uh, has a really good initial bite and torque. Uh, and it's easy on rotors, low dust, and it's good from, you know, from ambient all the way up to 800 degrees, which is uh, typically most street cars will never get over 800 degrees. They're more than likely to be in the, I've never checked this, but I'm just guessing four to 500 range. And then we've got a, a specific pad for autocross that's, that's really kind of, kind of cool. Uh, its temperature range goes from zero to a thousand degrees. Uh, it's got excellent initial bite and high coefficient of friction at lower temperatures, uh, along with progressive modulation. Uh, that's, that's specifically uh, what we call our, our uh, autocross pad because it's, it's you got bite right now. And if you get the brakes really hot, I mean, you, you, you're covered up to a thousand degrees. Uh, but the, you start getting into like the autocross pads. You could drive them on the street to the track, but if you if you drove them very much on the street, then you're 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 going to get some dust and maybe some noise. Uh, so, uh, like I say, it's it's good, great for autocross. Then we start getting into our track day tires, track tire, track day uh, pads. And we've got the, the, the combination that most of our guys are using are the 12s and the 10s. Uh, the 10s on the rear, and they've got, they're good from 118 degrees up to 1475. And the 12s on the front are from 173 up to 1860. And that will cover most track day people, even ones that don't have uh, brake ducts. Uh, of course, that brake ducts are going to wear a lot faster, but at least they're not going to fade and go away. And... If you think those are high temperatures on, on my car with brake ducts, my, my Mustang, I'm typically seeing uh, around 1,200 degrees rotor temperature. And uh, somebody asked if you can use like use an infrared uh, to uh, in, infrared temperature gauge to check the rotor temperature. And, and no, uh, all that's going to tell you is what the rotor temperature is sitting still. What we want to know is what's the maximum temperature that rotor sees under hard braking. I'm sure you've seen like in, in some of the like Daytona 24 hours or the mile of the night races, uh, you see the front brakes glowing red in the dark. Well, that's the temperature we want to know. What is the maximum temperature that are going? And then for the re really serious competition people, we've got some race pads that uh, uh, the uh, the rears would be the, the 16s that would go from, from 255 to 2000 degrees and the fronts from 610 up to 2100 degrees and that's a, that's for for serious competition where you're running brake rotor temperatures in the 14 1600 degree range uh, we had one customer i was talking to getting some brake pads for him and he said he, he had a set of g-locks and they, they didn't work for him at all he hated them we asked what compound he had and he had a gt350 
uh, a GT500, and it was a track day car. And somebody sold him a set of the 18s, the, the race compounds, which go from you know, 610 to 2100. Well, the range of 610 to 2100, to be in, in the really operating range of those, uh, where they really want, want to live, you're going to be at 14, 1600 degree rotor temperature. I guarantee you GT500 is not going to see that much rotor temperature. If you have too, too aggressive of a brake pad, and like for this guy, uh, what was happening is he was not getting the brake pads up to their optimum operating temperature which meant the he's running them cold, which means they're not going to work very well. They're going to be noisy. They're going to be make dust and they're not going to stop all that great. Uh, one, one here's, here's something that uh, you can uh, use to sell if your brake pads are too hard. If uh, I don't know if you've seen like some, and some people in, in videos and stuff, their brake pads will kind of, you know, run around the corner, will kind of squeal a little bit or they make some noise. If they're making noise, the compound's too hard. Uh, you need to drop that compound down a heat range because you, you're not in the optimum operating range of that brake pad. And of course, don't forget, you always have to have high temperature brake fluid. Uh, we've got, uh, we last, uh, about a year or so ago, we switched over to uh, the bare uh, brake fluid. It's uh, more cost effective than some of the others and actually has one of the highest uh, dry boiling points, which is good, you know, costs less. Higher, higher, dry, higher dry boiling point. Okay, I think that's, I've got to all the questions. So my question is, do you have a question? Have we got any uh, questions that have come in? So uh, one thing that Rory is mentioning is that the solar flares are to blame for the internet interruptions. So he's seen that as well. So that's probably why we had some interruptions. Um, now's the time to add your questions. So uh, feel free to ask Kenny anything you'd like. Uh, Kenny Wall, that's coming in. Look at, can you see the chat to see who's who's in here? Uh, no, that, that. Dave Rob. Dave Robinson from Niagara, he, he's here every week. He's on the Canadian side. Hi, Dave. And Fred Francher is here uh, every week as well. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we have somebody from Snowy Buffalo. That may be Jay. Uh, I can't see the Facebook username on that. Um, we also have Jeffrey Williams. He's saying hi from Massachusetts. And, of course, we have Joe Johnson from Humble, Texas, so it was one of our uh, speed therapy academy alumni and uh, he learned a lot so and then we also have roy merrick and he's from maple ridge british columbia and john walsham um he i'm guessing he's from indiana because he didn't realize that we were in indianapolis so he's kind of curious about that i i would expect john you would be visiting us shortly so we will welcome you by our facility let's see uh, speaking of which uh, since we moved and we've got a little more space here, uh, if uh, people want to join me for Cars and Coffee on Saturday, we do have some space. Uh, if clubs are coming through town and want to stop by or if you've got a small group that you just want to come by and hang out, uh, we actually have the space now. So that's something else I can put in people's heads. We also have uh, Kobe uh, uh, from... Uh Kobe Ward, he's here. He's here usually every week. We also have George from uh, Georgia, New, uh, George from New Jersey. So that's cool. Rob from Florida is here. We have lots of people here. Uh, uh, just so people know, we are simulcasting live on three different stations. One is uh, our the Kenny Brown uh, channel, YouTube channel. Uh, also, the Kenny Brown Speed Therapy Society private Facebook group. If you're not uh, part of that, you might want to join that. It's a pretty interesting group of like-minded indiv individuals. And we're also simulcasting live on the Kenny Brown Performance Facebook page. So it's pretty interesting. Now, if you have any questions, make sure you add them. Oh, we have Jack Siever from Omaha, Nebraska. Kenny, I think you know him from years ago, don't you, Jack Siever? Uh, I need, need some refreshing. <laughs> So yeah, we were in Omaha for a long time and before I moved to Indianapolis. And then before that, I saw somebody from New Jersey. I grew up outside of Philadelphia. So as, as a youth, 
Uh, you know, the Jersey Shore was always a popular place on, on uh, for the big weekends. Uh, we'd go over to uh, 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 Ocean City uh, during the day you know, to hang out, and then sometimes at night we'd go down to Wildwood because the girls were better down there. Uh, but that, that's a long time ago. Oh, that's silly. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions coming in. No question, guys. Uh, no question, somebody, Jay. Yeah, somebody has to have a question. Um, the other thing, what else is happening around the, the shop? You're working, you're starting to work on some new product development now that we're in our new facility. Are well, you ready we, to share we, that or is it still? We're, we're supposed to, we haven't started yet, but okay. we've got everything laid out. The, the next, we, we, we launched the, uh, the uh, K-Link uh, AGS 4.5 and that's the results we're getting from that is positively phenomenal. Uh, we've got guys that are not picking up when they put the suspension on, they're not picking up like tenths of a second, improving the lap times they are picking up seconds and a lot of them. I think the, the, uh, the least number of seconds improvement that we've heard on, uh, a lap times was three seconds improvement. And if he'd have listened to me and made an adjustment, he'd have picked up at least another second and a half, maybe two. Uh, they've got a lot of guys picking up four seconds, uh, David out in the West Coast with his Boss 302S, okay, Ford Racing Boss 302S race car. Uh, the difference between the Boss 302S and my full 4.5 suspension, uh, complete with the uh, with the uh, JRZ RS Pros double adjustable remote canister, and of course the you know, our, our uh, uh, Pro for R brakes. He picked up his first time that picked up eight seconds at Sonoma. And after a debrief on the phone, he picked up another two seconds the next day. So, you know, 4.5 is really, really working well. Uh, and then we also, so the next thing that's on the list is the, the double wishbone, the SLA that I started back a long, long time ago. Uh, we've got, we've got the, uh, the, the body of white over here. We pulled all the pieces out of storage. Uh, they're laying on the floor. We haven't put it up. But we're going to start looking at, at, at uh, getting that uh, the double wishbone put together for the front. Uh, it, that's, you know, uh, next spring, maybe uh, best case scenario. Uh, and then, like we talked about, the, uh, the SLA for the for the uh, uh, like the Fox SN95 cars. But also, I really want to do a new rear suspension for those cars. But that, again, that's at least a year, year and a half off. Uh, nobody's done a decent suspension for those cars. Uh, since well, uh, since we had our, uh, uh, what was it, our uh, track kit plus, and we've had we had somebody call that has one of the original uh, early cars with the track kit plus on that absolutely loves it. He says it still handles like a like a dream. Although we're gonna the uh, original Coney Reds uh, have got like 20 years on them, so we're gonna upgrade him to uh, uh, better better set of stock. We're gonna go to Coney Yellows uh, and, and upgrade him a little bit. So. Yeah, I mean, I wanted there's a lot of things I want to do. It's all just, you know, uh, time, people, and money is uh, is is always the always the issue. So I've got lots of things, lots of things in my head uh, that I want to get out there. So here, here's a comment from uh, from uh, this is from Brant, not Claudette. Uh, Brant actually is the first person in uh, uh, Canada to uh, purchase uh, your 4.5 or the K Link, and he's has a comment here now. So I don't know if you want to read it or if you want me to read it. Handling is so good that I have to ask if the Kaling actually has a better handling system than an IRS. Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of like they're, they're completely different. I mean, the IRS, the advantage of the IRS is you've got really good traction on, on, on bumpy tracks because you've got the wheels working independently. Uh, but the thing about the... The K link that makes it, you know, 4.5 that makes it pretty unique is like on, uh, like, like on a standard S197, as far as spring rates, like for a track car, we'll run something like a 650 front and a 400 rear. Uh, and that's kind of the way that typically will work out. Well, the, 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 the uh, uh, K link creates so much rear traction that we have to go way up on a rear spring rate to get the car balanced. Otherwise, Turning is great, and then I'll just push because the back of the car has so much grip. Just push, excuse me, pushes the front of the car. And what we ended up doing is we end up running like on our IRS cars, where we're on pretty much the same spring rate, front and rear. 
Well, with the 4.5, we're running the same spring rate front and rear. So there is a similarity to the, the IRS. Uh, the other thing that's a similarity is on like our 9904 Cobras uh, and all the IRS packages we do, we run a really, really low roll center. It's just not that far off the ground. The, uh, the K-Link actually runs the same roll center. So there's a lot of similarities. I think the, the advantage to the K-Link would have over an IRS is because it's live axle. You've got anti, a lot of anti-squat and you've got a lot better uh, drive off the corner than an IRS car. So uh, does it handle better? Uh, I'd say there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But, you know, with, with the K-Link, I mean, it just does everything so well. Uh, you know, being able, because live axle car is a drag racing car. You know, they, IRS cars don't make good drag racers. So if you can get like the, the, the launch and the forward bike of a live axle car, but with the spring rate and roll center of a, uh, of a uh, uh, IRS, uh, plus with the, with the, with the K-Link, we actually decouple axle roll and body roll. So no matter how much the body rolls, axle straight and flat on the ground, both tires have the same amount of weight on it all the time. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, it, it's a toss up. Uh, you know, my IRS works pretty good for the 99 to 04 Cobras. Um, I think with a high horsepower car, I'd be happier with the, the K-Link uh, just because it has that, it has the, uh, the advantage of the forward bite and the fact that it decouples axle roll and body roll. So it's kind of like a roundabout answer to the question. So why don't you talk about the picture behind you, the, the painting behind you? Uh, okay, that is, that was painted by a local Indianapolis artist by the name of Ron Burton. Now, when we first moved to Indy back in 94, uh, kind of like the place to hang out was, uh, uh, yeah, what was the name of that place? The Union Jacks. Union Jacks, Union Jacks Pub. Like a lot of the, the race people hung out at Union Jacks. Uh, and Ron Burton had a helmet collection there, an amazing helmet collection, and then also a lot of his paintings. Uh, he did everything in acrylic. And uh, uh, Carrie got together uh, with Ron, and she actually commissioned him. I'll go this way now. Uh, commissioned him to paint this, and it's called Kenny's Wild Horses. And in the picture are uh, some, of the, some of the Mustangs we had in magazines uh, back then. It's like the, you might not be able to see them all. There's one, two, three, four, five, six different Mustangs in the picture. So it's kind of like a, it's a really cool picture. You know, it's uh, near and dear to me. Uh, and uh, yeah, if anybody's seen any other Ron Burton work, it's pretty amazing. I actually had somebody uh, sent me, they were at a uh, uh, some sort of driving event at Mid Ohio. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, they had a, like some, some whole bunch of, uh, you know, pro drivers you know, working with the people. And Ron Burton was actually there doing sketches of everybody. So he, he was uh, pretty excited when I said that was a Ron Burton work. So, yeah, it, it's pretty cool. And the, the car, the, the drawing of the car in the background, that's that's pretty prominent. Uh, it used to be the logo for the, our company. So that was our old logo. I, I kind of like that logo. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm guessing we haven't had any more questions come in. We have a couple more. Uh, Tim. Hi, Tim. Tim Tomasek. Good. He said, good morning from Michigan. I have the rear grip kit on my 13 Boss. When I raise the rear with the floor jack under differential, when the tires leave the ground, the body will sway side to side. Why is that? Okay, let me think about that. When you raise it off the ground... The body will sway side to side. I'm thinking. Well, I mean, if, if you're jacking it up under the differential, uh, there's a panner bar on there, and the panner bar swings in an arc. And the, the you know, the, the, the panner bar is on an arc. So if it's going one way, I mean, it'll push the axle one way or the other way. Uh, so I'm guessing that's what, what, you're, what you're seeing is the arc from the panner bar would be moving the car. Because it's not, it's not just a straight shot. It, you know, 
it's on an arc, which means as you're jacking it up or down, it's going to pull the, the axle uh, in, in one of the other, other directions. I wouldn't call it swaying side to side. It does move, but it moves because the, the fanner bar is moving in an arc. That's a long fanner bar. Okay, if you have anybody else? Let's see here. We have uh, Brian West who had made a comment on the K-Link. He also has it on his car. He said, also say the higher the horsepower, the more you need the K-Link. So he's confirming what you said, Kenny. Yep. And, and Brian's got a uh, Roush, mm -hmm. uh, a really nice Roush. Yep. And then um, uh, let's see, this is uh, Brian. He's uh, not Claudia. This is, uh, I think Brian Fresian said that for sure, Brian, with the K-Link, you can really get the power, especially coming out of turns. Yeah, that, that's the whole idea is because you don't, because we, we, we segregate uh, or decouple axle roll and body roll going around the corner. You don't have to wait for the axle to settle to get back to the gas. Uh, as soon as you turn the wheel, the axle is already settled, both tires down, equal weight on both tires. You just get to the gas right then, which means you just, you just power through the corner and you just get incredible launch off the corner, which means you get really great terminal speed at the end of the straightaway. Okay, anybody else this morning, Gary? Well, uh, let's see. I think that's kind of kind of about it that I see as far as questions. And we did find out that Jack Sieber has uh, Dave Bittner's 85 Super GT now. That's why I think we've talked to Jack lately. So oh, cool. Dave Bittner's car. So that is pretty cool. Okay, if anybody doesn't know, Kenny was uh, based in Omaha, Nebraska for a number of years. Um, and then Joe Johnson has another comment. Kenny, love to, to see you at a local Opal track event to be able to visit in person. Love to see one of your great cars on track. So uh, fingers crossed. I mean, it's, it's uh, like I say, it's in, in the plans. It just, there's just no, there's no date on when that might happen. Like I said, we just got so much going on. Uh, I'm yeah, hoping to get a couple of tracks. Yeah, there's a couple of days this week. I didn't, didn't even get to turn my coffee pot on until lunchtime. If that tells you anything. And you guys know how much I love my coffee. So anyway, we are going to, this is the new studio that we're in. We're working on adjusting it. We're getting some new signage. Um, and we'll probably show you the whole uh, studio at another date. We're working on still camera angles and everything. So it's a pretty cool area. Kenny can do a lot more in here. Um, also, eventually we're going to be able to get out in the shop and you'll be able to go into the cars and show you different things that we're working on. So that's sort of where we're heading with cars and coffee. Um, also expect some more guests in 2022. Um, and we're going to be changing up the format a little bit. So uh, we're really yeah. excited about that. And yeah, actually, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, we've, we've been playing with the lights. I think we've got a little better lighting this week than we had last week. Uh, and something weird that happened is uh, I got like a new camera on a tripod so we could try to get really, really uh, crisp pictures. And it worked perfectly last night on Zoom. I mean, absolutely perfectly. Uh, of course, this morning when we hooked everything up, it wouldn't work at all. So we had to go back to my my other my older camera that I had been using. But uh, yeah, we're going to try to keep uh, making improvements as we go along. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of happy with the way the lighting worked out this morning. I think it's a lot better than last week. So if you guys have any subjects that you'd like Kenny to cover in the upcoming Cars and Coffee, please put them in the comments because uh, that's what spurs what he talks about. So just kind of think uh, um, and add the, com you, that's what the comments, what you'd like him to talk about. I know next week, Kenny, I think you're talking about uh, you're going to have a mini shock sen seminar. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. I think uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, we actually, as luck would have it, uh, we've got a bunch of suspension systems going out. And we're going to have one of each of the three shock packages that we offer for the uh, uh, S197 cars. Uh, H&R, Strange, and JRZ. So we do kind of like a little uh, mini shock seminar on that. And uh, uh, like the Speed Therapy Academy starts this Tuesday night. We're going to leave registration open up to the second week of the Academy. Uh, if anybody is is thinks they, they might be interested. If you might be interested, do it. I mean, you will learn so much. You're going to be positively amazed at how much knowledge and information come away from after the 16 weeks. And if it's a budgetary thing, then get together with Carrie. We've got payment plans uh, that gets it down to, I think, Carrie said like $150 or something. Well, 
what was the, the minimum carry? Yeah, the very minimum is one hundred and fifty dollars a month, so okay. it's it's pretty affordable. So with that, and then of course, any of our academy members uh, get lots of perks. Uh, at the end, they get their certificate of accomplishment. Okay, and then they get their, their they get their uh, uh, polo shirt. I don't have polo shirt on today because it's it's chilly, damp, and and drizzly this morning. So I opted for a long sleeve shirt. And then of course they get their Speed Therapy Academy notebook. Okay. And then uh, they get their a lot of other perks. They get 10% discount on Kenny Brown products. I uh, get 10% discount on Bear Brake products, which is like brake kits and rotors. Uh, and then we also on, uh, we talked about brake pads. Uh, if you're an Academy member or alumni, you get uh, your track pads are, are pre-bedded for free, which is just saves so much time at the track. And of course, you've got a lot of access to me. Uh, if you're trying to get your car, sort, car sorted out or driving, uh, you know, I'm here. As you guys know, this is, you, you can't get, you can't get what I talk about anyplace else on the internet or anywhere for that matter. So I mean, the Academy is, is if you really want to, if you want to be the guy at the track that knows what the heck he's doing, uh, then the Academy is for you. Or okay. if you're doing uh, autocross, last time we had, I think, two or three autocrossers mm -hmm. uh, in the Academy. And we've also had like a couple of three uh, streetcar guys in the Academy too that just want to learn more about their cars and how they work. So uh, please, if you're interested, sign up. If you have any, any friends that think they might be interested, uh, you know, get them in touch with Carrie or, or Rich and uh, we, can, we can get them fixed up. So if we don't have any more questions today. We, we actually have one that snuck in here and uh, some future topics as well. So we'll talk about that. One thing I wanted to add about your mini um, uh, shock workshop is that the shocks you're covering, I think we may have an SN95 in there and then the JRZs flow right over to the S550. So it's not just for S197s, this workshop, it's for all cars. Yeah, the um, GRZs cross over the 550s and the Strange cross back to the SN95 and Fox. Mm -hmm. So you're covering H&R, Strange, and uh, GRZs. It's the three shocks that Kenny will be covering and showing you. Um, let's see, uh, uh, Colby has a question. What do you think about the possibility of the S650 having all-wheel drive and hybrid drive? Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard a little bit about that. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, there's, there's all wheel drive is really the hot ticket. Um, you know, and any, a lot of your really high end, high end uh, sports cars will have all wheel drive uh, because you got four wheel, four wheels driving it. And um, of course the front and rear is biased, but the interesting thing is the, uh, the GT 350s came out. Uh, when I saw the spindle, I thought it was quite curious because the way the spindle was laid out, uh, there was a hole in the middle, and as soon as I saw that spindle, I knew that at some point a uh, front drive electric motors was coming because that's the only thing that makes sense for them to have a hole in, in the middle of the in the spindle. I mean, it, was, it looked like a spindle for the, the back of the car where you've got you know the axle going through the spindle. So I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, I think it'd be pretty darn cool. Probably pretty darn expensive too, but uh, everything's getting more expensive. But yeah, I think I think I mean uh, the hybrid uh, hybrid uh, it seems to be a really hot thing. Uh, I, I prefer that to just pure electric right now. Uh, I mean, like like Formula One cars. I mean that those are hybrid applications. They have they have uh, electric motors and uh, internal combustion motors, and they make buckets of power. Although they're only rear wheel drive, not all wheel drive. So yeah, I, th I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I would like to see that. And like I say, as soon as I saw the GT350 spindles a number of years back, I knew right away that at some point they were gonna have uh, electric motors driving the front wheels. So that was my guess uh, when, when the first GT350s first came out. And Brad, Brad says that they're running behind um, on building the next gen. So uh, Ford's behind by about a year. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. Everybody's yeah. behind right now. 
Yeah. And then here's here's a comment that uh, uh, George would like you to talk about uh, in one of your upcoming Cars and Coffee sessions is SN95 improvements. Okay. So. Yeah. Let, let me think about that. I mean, we don't have we, we, the, our, our SN95 like suspension has been focused on the IRS cars uh, because we do IRS better than anybody else in the aftermarket. But yeah, I, I can talk about uh, I, I can talk about that. I, I like the SN95s. I mean, I, I'd like to build another one. You know, Kermie, my my little green uh, uh, 2001 uh, uh, Mustang that we turned into like a cool Cobra uh, with the IRS. And that, that was the first car to have the full-on IRS with all the geometry changes. And that car was so much fun to drive. Uh, of course, it had a prototype 4.6 uh, Ford Racing FR500 engine in it, which gave it lots of lots of lots of go. But uh, yeah, there's, there's some things we could talk about. Uh, you, you more interested in chassis or power or, I, I, I can talk about all of it. I, I can kind of make a list of things that you can do. So. And then Brian West getting back to electric car. He says, uh, uh, patent pictures show electric motors hung off the block. Yeah, I would left that the base, best place to put them. I mean, if I was, I, I was doing it, I mean, that's, you know, I'd have them like down low, because you can get small, you know, pretty compact electric motors now. Uh, that's the only place it makes sense to put them is right, right below the front of the motor, just you know, you know goes straight out to the, uh, the spindles. And then we have a comment from Rory. Hi, Rory. Um, is there a better brand of bearing to be buying for rear 04 IRS Cobra spindles? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Uh, that is like the really weak point on the IRS uh, spindles in the back is the, is the, uh, the bearings. Uh, a long, long, not a long, long time ago, 2003, I think, with our World Challenge. We did a, a World Challenge GT uh, Cobra, Mustang Cobra, uh, with a customer. And uh, with the IRS in the back and a front grip kit in the front. And, uh, uh, you know, dry sump motor, I mean, the whole thing. And we were continually having problems with uh, rear pad knockback. And so what we decided to do, <laughs> kind of a long way around the story, but what we decided to do is we, we bolted the spindle to the, like the like steel beams, we made a bracket, welded a bracket to it and bolted the spindle, took a big bar, and it was pretty easy to move that spindle back and forth. So we thought, ah, we'll fix this. So what we did is we put some reinforcement on the back of the spindle and we made it really rigid. Uh, and then we headed off to do a day of testing with Ford Racing at Groton. Uh, and uh, the car lasted maybe about three laps, and then all of a sudden the uh, one one wheel axle and everything went shooting across the track. Uh, it, it separated itself from the car. And what had happened is there was so much movement. We 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 firmed up the the, uh, the spindle. Okay, so then it falls to the next weak point. There's so much movement in the, in the rear wheel bearings that the rotor actually came over and wore through the spindle where the, where the lower uh, cross axis joint is, wore through that and that it just it broke and the whole thing came out. So, I mean, yeah, there's, there's we, we've talked about doing a spindle in the back, but the whole, the bearing thing is a really, is, is, the, is the sticking point, trying to come up with, uh, uh, you know, we can only go with, it has to be conical bearings, opposed conical bearings, and that's the only way you can carry a lot of load. The, uh, the bearings that rear axle bearings that are, on the on the cobras are actually front wheel bearings off a of Taurus, I think, and they're, they're double row ball bearing. And if you get double ball bearings, I mean, there's, I mean, they just roll round and round, which means that you know, if you go like this, it doesn't change, and they they don't take any load at all. Uh, so we did one would have to have like conical bearings that were at an angle opposing each other, uh, so it wouldn't move, and that seems that is the uh, the real sticking point. Uh, we were talking about it. We've had some meetings on it. Uh, we had so far haven't had a lot of time put into it, but that's the sticking point is that uh, you're coming up with a, a bearing pack that's going to be able to take lots of load. So unfortunately, no, we just just replace them really often. We always used to carry a couple with us uh, when we went to the track uh, because we know they're going to get worn out. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but unfortunately I don't. At least, at least I don't know of any. I don't know if anybody else out there does. Okay, so that kind of wraps it up for today. I just wanted to remind everybody that next week Kenny is having a mini 
uh, I, we'll call it a coil over shock workshop. Uh, you're gonna talk a lot of tech about shocks and then also show the three shock packages that we use and the differences between them. Um, if you have friends, this would be a good time to invite them next week. Um, again, they can view on the Kenny Brown uh, YouTube channel, Kenny Brown Performance YouTube channel, Kenny Brown Performance Facebook page, and also then Kenny Brown's uh, Speed Therapy Society uh, private Facebook group. So um, please invite your friends. And if you like what Kenny showed you today, please give him a few thumbs up. And um, I guess, Kenny, I'll let you sign off and we'll say goodbye. Okay, well, I'm glad you could join us today. Uh, I just thought of something else and then I forgot right away. Uh, must, must be the sun's, sun flares. Uh, it's uh, giving me a short circuit in my head. So we appreciate you showing up. Uh, uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. This is actually episode 75. I mean, I never would have believed this but over a year ago when we did the first couple, we'd make it to episode 75. And all the all the episodes up through today can be found in the Kenny Brown Performance TV YouTube uh, page. And we've got a lot of, a, a lot of, all the content, all 75 episodes are in there. Plus Brad's cut out uh, bits and pieces. So we have sort of like a, lot, a whole bunch of little tech things in there. So, I mean, it, it's a, it's a great place to, uh, you know, to go if you, you know, want to want to try to figure something out or learn something, uh, you know, check out, check out the Kenny Brown, Kenny Brown Performance TV YouTube uh, channel. And then also, of course, if you've got uh, more technical questions and need help with something, uh, build plan for your car or you know, something that isn't working right, uh, sign up for one of my 15-minute consults. I think you can do that on, on our webpage. And uh, Brad typically puts that up somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's on here somewhere. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I think I'm the only guy out there that will actually take time uh, to talk, to, uh, to, talk to, to people about their problems with real information. Remember, I started this because there's so much bad information on the internet. I tell people the two worst places to get information for your car is the internet and the paddock. And of course, the guy down the street that knows everything too. I have to throw that into there. So anyway, you want if it's a question you need to answer to, you need help with a build plan, or what do you do first so you don't have to redo things, then uh, set up a 15-minute council. I'll be happy to talk to you. And then also anybody that gets a coilover set up, we'll talk about this next week. I actually have a personal conversation with you to find out how you use your car, what the horsepower is, what the tires are, and then I will personally pick uh, spring rates specifically for for your application uh, so that uh, uh, so you know that it'll work really well so with that I think uh, I think I'm chattering on here so we will probably sign off for today uh, everybody I'm glad you could join us thank you for watching and uh, we will see you next week Academy guys I'll see you Tuesday see you Tuesday night so have a, have a great rest of your weekend everybody thanks for watching